Less than 14% of students get this GMAT Focus Data Insights question correct. Are you one of them? Pause the video and solve the question first. Then keep watching to see if you got the answer right. Here is the question. The flowchart represents a mathematical algorithm that takes one positive integer as the input and returns a positive integer as the output. Processes are indicated in the rectangular symbols in the flowchart. Each process is represented by an equation, such as p equals p plus 1. In this particular process, 1 is added to the current value of p, and the sum, p plus 1, becomes the new value of p. For example, if p equals 8 before the process, then p equals 9 after the process. Here are the questions. Question 1. A value p equals 50 is initially entered. When s first has a value of s equals 10, p has a value of 61, 57, 59, 51, 53. Question 2. An initial entry that reaches an output in the fewest steps is 10, 31, 12, 1, 3. Ready for the answer explanation? Overview. Without plugging in any particular number, I'm going to just follow the process step by step and see what I notice. At the start, s equals 12, and p can be any number I enter. The first thing that happens is the question, is p even or odd? If it's even, we add 1, making it odd. The only other place in the entire charge where p can change is the p equals p plus 2 box. Once p is odd, adding 2 will just produce another odd number. So what happens to p? If it's even, it is made odd, and once it's odd, it just moves up by 2 through the odd numbers consecutively. If p is not prime, the number simply repeats that upper loop, not prime, add 2, is it even? No, not prime. Repeat. While going around that loop, s doesn't change. The only opportunity for s to change is if p is a prime number. What happens when p gets to an odd value? Then we move down to the decision diamond, is p less than s? That's a crucial place. Since s only starts at 12 most of the time, the answer will be no. s will decrease by 1, and if it's not 0, then it returns to that same upper loop. Thus, usually s decrease by 1 every time p hits a prime number, so p will keep rising until it hits its 12th prime number value. But, if the input is small, and p actually is smaller than s, then s decreases by p. That is to say, s decreases not just by one, but by several notches all at once. The process accelerates significantly, and it will take far fewer steps to complete the entire process. Notice also the output, the final value of p, will have to be a prime number, because the only way that we break out of that upper loop and get to the lower half of the flowchart is when p is prime. So the output is always prime. Those are all the things I noticed just scanning the flowchart without plugging anything in. Now on to question one. I will use ordered pairs of the form P, S to discuss this. I recommend ordered pairs or triplets for keeping track of how numbers change as we move through the steps. Enter P equals 50. So at that point we are at 50, 12. Is P even? Yes. So add one to get 51, 12. Is P prime? No. So 51 equals three times 17. So we go around the upper loop. Adding two to P is 53, 12. Then P is odd, and now 53 is in fact prime. Drop down to the lower decision dimension. P equals 53 is not less than S equals 12. So subtract one from S, 53, 11. We see S is not zero. So back up to the upper loop. Add two to P to get 55, 11. Is P even? No. Is P prime? No. 55 equals five times 11. Around the upper loop. Add two to P, 57, 11. Is P even? No. Is P prime? No. 57 equals 3 times 19. Around the upper loop. Add 2 to P, 59, 11. Is P even? No. Is P prime? Yes. 59 is in fact prime. Again, drop down to the lower decision dimension. Of course, P equals 59 is not less than S equals 11. So subtract 1 from S. 59, 10. That's it. S now has a value of 10. So the value of P at this point is P equals 59. That's the answer. D. 59. Next, let's go over question 2. Here, the analysis we did above really helps us. For most numbers, larger numbers, s will decrease one notch at a time, and we will have to move p through 12 different prime numbers to reach an output. But, if we can have a p get down to the lower half that's less than s equals 12, then we can reduce s by a whole lot at once, and vastly accelerate the process. Reject p equals 31. It's too big. Even p equals 12 will not work. That's even, so immediately it will be nudged up to p equals 13 at the very beginning, and then it's already bigger than s that doesn't work. Suppose we start with p equals 10, also even, so immediate it nudges up to p equals 11, which is prime. That would go to the lower loop, and in one fell swoop, s would go down from s equals 12 to s equals 1. Great! That means there would be only one more trip around the upper loop. 
P goes up to P equals 13, which is also prime, and back to the lower half. S goes to zero, and the process outputs P equals 13 and is done. That's a lightning-fast conclusion. It only goes all the way around that upper loop once. The smaller starting values, P equals 1, which is not prime, and P equals 3, will require more than two circuits in the upper loop, so they will take more steps. Of these five answers, nothing else would reach an output as quickly as P equals 10. The answer is C, 10.